Okay, uh, hi everybody. Uh, I'm Neethi. I work as a data scientist for IBM Watson. And um, the first talk that I'm doing today is on Semantix, which is um, tools for paraphrase detection and paraphrase uh, generation. Um, two unanswered questions on this particular topic slide. The first is a little bit more about me. Um, I'm Neethi. I did my uh, bachelor's in computer science from Bitspilani in India, and then did my master's from the University of Texas at Austin. Um, I am consistently in a battle against um, entropy. Uh, I'm on the road uh, to become what I'd like to think of as a, Bayes a Bayesian ninja. And I belong to that group of people who um, laugh out loud, really loud. Uh, in my capacity as a data scientist at IBM Watson, I work on conceptualizing core machine learning and natural language processing algorithmic paradigms, um, and also uh, putting together cognitive solutions specific to various partners. Uh, this talk is going to be on semantics, which is basically a spin-off on same plus semantics. It's tools for paraphrase detection and paraphrase generation, and it does this in four primary steps. The first is by discovering rewordings of sentences across domains, um, then bucketing these questions um, into hierarchical categories within the same domain, identifying those buckets which have sparse data. That's going to kick off the paraphrase generation piece um, so that you're able to enrich um, the overall training set for the deep QA system. All of these pieces I will be going into more detail, but holistically, the entire purpose of this project is to expedite question and answer mapping, whether it's one-to-one, one-to-many, many-to-one, -to -one, or many-to-many. -many. OK, so uh, with that, let's uh, step into the uh, one of the primary pipelines of semantics, which is the paraphrase detection. Um, I'm going to go over step by step about how this pipeline was um, conceptualized and how it functions. So step one was um, aggregating scores using an ensemble classifier for both structural as well as semantic similarity. Let's for uh, some time focus on the structural similarity bit. Um, you'll see that there are five um, algorithmic paradigms there. That's Jaro, Jaro Winkler, Dice, Cosine, and Levenstein. Now, each of these algorithms, conventionally, they get used to compute edit distances between words at a character level. So for instance, if you had the word friend, F-R-I-E-N-D, and you had a misspelling of the word friend, say F-R-E-I-N-D, in that case, there is one single swap between these two words, which implies that the edit distance between these two words at a character level is one. Now, what I have done is I've basically augmented all of these algorithms to function at a word level. So now think of it as we have two sentences, sentence A and sentence B, where sentence A, say, has five words and sentence B has six words. That means uh, in sentence B, obviously, there is one insertion. And let's say there's one swap somewhere in the middle. That would imply that the edit distance across these two sentences is now two because of one insertion and one swap. So effectively, what I've been able to do is by augmenting each of these algorithmic paradigms in an ensemble, I have been able to find the reordering that occurs between two sentences from a syntactic construct level. So that is variation from a syntactic construct. And that's how I get my score of structural similarity. Let's call that score x. Um, we then move on into semantic similarity, which is crucial because just structural similarity is not going to give you any sense of whether um, whole just relying on structural similarity is not going to tell you whether two sentences are always paraphrases of each other. So for the semantic similarity, semantics powers of two frameworks, frameworks which you guys would be aware of. Uh, that's word to wec uh, which is a distributional semantic framework. And there's WordNet, which is a lexical database. Now, uh, with word to wec um, because it is a distributional semantic framework, it has been constructed on the hypothesis that linguistic terms with similar meaning would have similar distributions. Or in other words, basically, words which are similar would appear in similar contexts. So, um, however, what you need to remember with naive word to vec is that there is a vector representation only at a word level. It's not constructing vectors at a phrasal level because of which there is a lack of context. So, think of it this way. Um, 
if you had the word pair cats and dogs and if you had the word pair boys and girls. Now cats and dogs could appear in a similar context to boys and girls if you're talking about eight-year-old boys and girls who would want to fight with each other. But that in no way means that cats are synonymous to girls or that dogs are synonymous to boys, which is why we kind of need to take into account context uh, when working with a framework like word to vec which is why um, in semantics, I have augmented the manner in which word to vec functions to a word to vec plus plus, which basically enables me to generate contextualized phrasal vectors. And the manner in which I do this is with an integration of LSA, that's latent semantic an analysis, and LDA, which is latent Dirichlet allocation. Now, LSA basically generates a set of concepts based on sentences and terms. So if you want to think of it at a high level, when you're given n sentences, it is going to reference the concepts present in those sentences. And LDA, which is latent Dirichlet allocation, is a generative model. And what it does is that it explains a set of observations using a bunch of unobserved groups, uh, thereby establishing why some kinds of data are more similar than other kinds of data. So at a high level, basically, when you're given n sentences, it's going to list out the topics which are referenced in those sentences. So the learning problem that I have is something like this, where I have all of these sentences, each of which are of variable lengths. And what I want to do is I want to get a fixed n-dimensional representation for each of these sentences. And then if those um, sentences are closer in that distributional semantic space, that would imply that these are semantically similar and so are paraphrases of each other. So for everybody who um, is from or is familiar with deep learning, uh, Think of this as a recursive autoencoder. And I'll still explain uh, this particular piece because this is what is the crux of Semantix's paraphrase detection pipeline. So um, for those of you who are not familiar with what an autoencoder does, basically um, the number of uh, nodes in the hidden layer of an autoencoder are lesser than those that are present in the input layer or the output layer. So typically an autoencoder would have, say, 2n input nodes and then n hidden nodes and then, again, say, 2n output nodes. Um, so what happens is when you're providing 2n input nodes, uh, this is getting encoded in the um, n hidden node layer, after which uh, it's getting decoded to recreate the 2n output nodes. The advantage of using autoencoders is um, also because this allows you to function in an unsupervised manner, as opposed to using a neural network architecture, which would do um, something similar, but in a supervised manner. So with an autoencoder, typically, what I'm able to do is I'm able to automatically extract features which are present in a sentence. And what I do with this particular autoencoder framework is that, is that I collapse an entire sentence into a phrasal representation. The way that I do this is, um, like I said, uh, every sentence has been, um, by using LSA and LDA, I'm able to pick out the most important concepts and topics referenced in the sentence. So this is now my sentential representation. Um, I then take the first two concepts or first two topics or concept, topic, topic, concept, whatever it is, each of which are n-dimensional uh, vector representations. So I basically aggregate them. That gives me a two n-dimensional input, which gets fed into this autoencoder. Right? Is everybody with me so far? OK. What's a C? C? Uh, so it could be a concept or a topic. Um, so T, T, is the topic. T is the topic, yes. So um, this gets fed as input into the autoencoder. And the autoencoder uh, on the encoding process is going to convert this one concept or topic or two topics or whatever it is, you get the point, into an n-dimensional vector representation. Now this gets done recursively. So say I had four words in a sentence. Um, I plug this two um, n-dimensional vector into the autoencoder. So that's going to give me a hidden layer representation, which is n-dimensional. I then use this along with the next uh, word, which could be a concept or topic. 
and recursively plug it into an autoencoder again to get an n-dimensional representation. So this way, effectively, at the end, I have been able to successfully collapse my entire sentence into an n-dimensional representation of the most pertinent concepts and topics by using a recursive autoencoder, which is basically stacked one above the other. So now that this kind of collapsing has occurred, what we have built through this process is that I have been able to render a phrasal representation for every sentence as opposed to a simplistic uh, word vector representation. And this has been done by leveraging word to vec by leveraging LSA and LDA, and by exploiting um, the concept of an artificial neural network um, by using a recursive autoencoder. So this is the piece where the distributional semantic framework gets leveraged. That's the piece one. Um, let's call that score that I get. Let's call that score that I get A. Um, now, we also uh, wanted to look into exploiting a lexical uh, database. Uh, the reason there is simple for a deeper semantic compositionality understanding, basically to get a better sense of synonyms and context-specific words. So um, for uh, WordNet, there are a bunch of state-of-the-art algorithms that exist called HSO, LCH, and you'll find this on the WordNet page, uh, LESC, WHOOP, rest and so on. Basically, these tell you how related um, certain words are with others. In WordNet, there is a concept of synset, which basically means all of these words are semantically associated. So um, WordNet gives you that. But again, WordNet gives you that at a word level. So again, uh, it's become WordNet++ plus plus because I've augmented it to function at a phrasal level. And that's done by utilizing a machine translation metric called blue. Uh, which helps me understand semantic relatedness uh, by uh, figuring out for n-gram co-occurrence counts. So that's how that piece gets leveraged. So let's call that score B. So now for my um, aggregated score of structural and semantic relatedness, what I do is that I weigh structural similarity at 0.4, and I weigh semantic similarity at 0.6. Uh, the reasoning behind this is you could obviously weigh structure and semantic similarity based on whatever is convenient to you. I just found that uh, 0.4 and 0.6 seem to be the sweet spots, um, and it's helping me render higher accuracy scores for this particular task. Um, so this was that particular piece. Yes. It's a uh, machine translation metric that gets used. It, you, you get packages to basically um, use the blue metric. Yep. Um, so once I have this particular score, the second step was to implement a hierarchical clustering algorithm that's going to group these sentences by thresholding on this particular score. Now, as you guys would be familiar, with any kind of clustering algorithm, you require two things. You require a metric and you require a linkage criterion. So this was the metric that I chose to use instead of using simplistic Euclidean or Manhattan distance or so on. And uh, the linkage criterion that got used was a centroid linkage um, criterion, which basically tells me that the distance between uh, sets of observations should be studied as a function of the pairwise distances between those observations. So I use centroid linkage for that. And it's a agglomerative bottom-up clustering. So basically, when you have a whole num um, a huge bunch of sentences. It's going to group these sentences starting bottom up um, on the basis of syntax and semantic relatedness. Um, I substantiated this classifier's ability to recognize hierarchical clusters within the same domain. Um, tested this on the Microsoft paraphrase corpus and on semi-val data for standard corpora validation, and also compared the performance against uh, the state of the art. So um, here are the results. Uh, as you'd see, the baseline um, is by um, Halsey. Um, cosine similarity with TF-IDF weighting is what they used. The accuracy was 65.4 uh, and an F of 75.3. Um, Samantix beats uh, even the last paper that came out in 2008. Um, in this particular space of unsupervised 
uh, clustering by intent or unsupervised paraphrase uh, detection. This is not any kind of semi-supervised or uh, supervised algorithms. None of those are mentioned here. Um, the accuracy of Samantix is 74.8 and hits an F of 82.6. Um, the reasoning that I would attribute as to why uh, we were able to beat the state of the art is primarily because Samantix um, has the ability to account for both structural and semantic similarity, which like you would see in uh, the prior literature, none of those papers work with. And um, Samantix also is um, useful and distinguishes itself from um, other papers in this domain because it allows for a contextualized understanding uh, without any kind of hand designing of representation. So that's why it works as a superior algorithmic framework, uh, which is why it was able to beat the state of the art. I'm going to um, show you guys a demo. Um, Semantics has been used often with a bunch of our, yes. That's correct, absolutely. But a spelling correction, like I said, it's happening at a word level, right? So certain characters are misspelled. Here, I'm not talking about it at a character level, insertion, deletion, replacement, or swap. I'm talking about it at a word level. So how different uh, it is a sunny day, sunny day it is, although it's not grammatically correct, but there is a syntactic reordering there, and that's what gets captured. <laughs> OK, so um, I'm going to show you guys a, um, a demo. So basically, uh, Samantix has been used with a lot of our uh, IBM Watson partners uh, because we have a service <laughs> called the Natural Language Classifier, which is basically the deep QA um, that Watson is known of for question answering. And um, as training data for this kind of question answering system, we kind of need the consumers or the partners to put together something known as a ground truth, uh, where they have a bunch of questions that uh, the users of the application that they want to build would be asked and they have to label these questions to an intent. Obviously, as you can see, there are overheads associated with time and computation to do this. So this is where um, Samantix gets leveraged because it uh, clusters questions on the basis of the intent associated with the questions because it works as a paraphrase detection tool. So I'm going to work with dummy data because obviously partner confidentiality, I cannot show you the other data. but. Um, like you'd see, the input here was basically a bunch of 18 questions. And um, on an analysis, what's happening is that questions which have a similar intent or basically are referencing similar concepts or are about the same thing semantically, even if they are varied in structure, they get grouped into the same cluster bucket. Uh, the next question that you guys would probably ask me is, but hey, Niyati, the cluster description names don't seem great. And yes, that's true. And the reasoning behind that is because Samantix is an unsupervised um, clustering algorithm. So right now, the cluster descriptions are basically brute forced uh, to pick out the most pertinent nouns from one of the queries in that bucket. So like you would uh, see for cluster ID 1 itself, what adds to shoe comfort when running, um, it's brute forced to pick out shoe comfort, for instance, as a cluster description. Um, that's the space where there is scope for improvement, and the scope for improvement uh, comes through by making it a semi-supervised, introducing for supervision, basically. If you have a customized ontology for your data, uh, obviously the manner in which um, the cluster descriptions get rendered would improve with training, but uh, this is a demo of that. Um, do we have any more questions? of the matter is that it still beats um, the state of the art, even if there weren't uh, that significant an improvement, um, which, is, which is all that I can say for this. Uh, the reasoning behind it is that we are using a contextualized understanding and a phrasal representation. But uh, yeah, um, I don't really have anything else to say as to why there wasn't as much of uh, an improvement that you'd like. Sure. I mean, this is IBM's own algorithm, but I'm saying if I will claim something, is it uh, uh, metrics, JCN, is, a, uh, is that an implementation? Or is that JCN is a WordNet similarity uh, 
It's one of those algorithms uh, that's provided by WordNet. That's, uh, that's a vector-based. This is a vector-based plus a deep semantic uh, compositionality-based framework. Yes. Yes. Um, you, yeah. Did you experiment with, uh, with text of different lengths, like with right. the paraphrase um, data set that we tested on had uh, things of different lengths? Yes, did absolutely, yeah. Did you notice any difference between uh, accuracy on <laughs> All of these sentences are of different lengths, so I'm not working with, uh, they're paraphrases, so they're not needed to have the same length. Yeah. So I, I understand that. I, my question was more towards, did you try to like, um, uh, do stratified sampling and see if, it worked, if your approach worked better for a certain length? Or oh, uh, no, I haven't uh, done that. Um, I haven't done that. So you're saying basically, is there a change in accuracy scores in accordance to the length of the sentence? No, I haven't done that uh, kind of validation test, but it might be interesting. It's something to look to. Yes. So uh, what about the benchmarks compared to the defining time and prediction? So I, I don't have that uh, slide with me here because I knew that I had to get this done in 30 minutes. But I, I, I do have one uh, separately, and we can talk, post the talk. Yes. Yes. Uh, Mm -hmm. Yeah, so I actually did a comparison against my ensemble classifier just for structural similarity versus that, uh, and they perform comparable. Uh, so, uh, so I didn't really replace mine with the newest that's come out because they are doing comparable. Uh, the reasoning behind that would probably be because, be because I'm using an ensemble as opposed to just um, using one single algorithmic framework, which is what they're doing. Uh, but uh, in addition to that, we have a semantic similarity component. And so overall, our accuracy and F scores are higher. Uh, these, um, all of these results are on the MSR uh, PP and the SEMIVAL uh, data set together. I'm actually aware of a paper that reports higher accuracy and more support. For, is it for unsupervised um, clustering? Because I am validating this only across all unsupervised clustering frameworks for paraphrase detection. Okay, because uh, all I have is from the SEMIVAL and the MSR PP uh, up to date, and this is um, the maximum, but um, I'll be happy to look at that paper post the talk. What's the paper? It's called um, Dynamic Coding and Unfolding Request Okay, I, I'll look at that. Uh, what year was it published? Um, I'm not sure. Okay. All right, so uh, yes. Yeah, so uh, with uh, the SEMIVAL data set in particular, uh, they do have, um, they have a reference, uh, they've manually created certain things which are paraphrases of each other or not, so you basically have to check whether uh, those sentence IDs are present in um, your paraphrase detection once you've run the entire framework. So uh, basically, whether it's a hit or a miss, it was a binary assessment of whether it's been captured as a paraphrase of a particular sentence and placed correctly in that cluster or not. Yeah. Yes. Correct. Yeah. Yeah, that's that's exactly what I'm working on right now um, to figure out if there is uh, that kind of variation that causes a difference. Yep. Okay, so I have another piece to go over uh, really quickly, which is the paraphrase generation. Um, so uh, with the paraphrase generation, this initially started off as a templatized approach. Um, 
but as obvious when you're using a templatized approach, it's heavily constrained on syntax. So for instance, if I gave in, uh, it is a sunny day, it's gonna come back with it is a bright day. Uh, but this is true for most uh, data-driven approaches because um, while they might be able to find and capture more nuanced substitutions from a context-sensitive data perspective, um, it's still these kind of algorithmic paradigms are not really very adept at introducing function words and following like general principles of grammar. So um, the idea was to not just rely on syntactic constraints, but instead conceptualize a surface realizer, which is able to generate paraphrases that are syntactically variant yet retain semantic meaning. So uh, this is done by following these four steps. First is where you take in word level alignments of two sentences which are paraphrases of each other as input. Um, you then project those word level alignments into something called logical forms, which is effectively um, an automatic parse of the sentence. Um, dependency parsing is what's getting used. These projected alignments um, or logical forms are then converted into disjunctive logical forms, or DLFs. And this is the piece that I've tweaked because uh, I've converted the disjunctive logical forms in both directions. And these disjunctive logical forms basically represent alternate choices at a level of semantic dependency. So let me explain that a little bit. Essentially, for English, we assume that there is structure in language only when we read from left to right, as in it's unidirectional. Uh, now that I am speaking, you might be able to predict the next word that I am going to say, right? So uh, that's because it's unidirectional, but obviously for a machine, uh, there is structure in language even when it's interpreting it from right to left. So what I did is, um, conceptualized a bi-directional surface realizer, which is able to tap into structure of language from left to right as well as from right to left. Uh, so think of it this way. Uh, if I had a bigram uh, model, given um, the current word, I'm able to predict the next word, say for left to right. And let's do the same thing for right to left. So given the next word, I would be able to predict the previous word. So if I use a bi-directional bigram model, I'm effectively working on it as a trigram model, except that I'm conditioning on the middle word, and I'm able to predict the next word as well as the previous word. So this um, kind of usage of a bidirectional bigram model, which then got fed into uh, OpenCCG for the NBEST realization, enables me to um, get a more varied uh, paraphrase generation result. And uh, I'm able to basically even uh, find grammatical alternatives to the original sentence, and also able to mix and match content across the paraphrases provided as input. OpenCCG is, uh, for those who are interested, it's an open source Java library to which I've made some tweaks. OpenCCG was, um, is uh, something that came out of uh, Jason Baldridge, one of my professors back at UT. He contributed heavily to this effort. But yeah, that's pretty much about the paraphrase generation piece. I don't have a real-time demo for you guys since this takes a little bit longer to run. But here is an example. So if uh, these were two sentences that I provided as input to Samantix's paraphrase generation, um, I get a whole bunch of uh, potential outputs, which are all paraphrases of these sentences. You can see that apart from um, there is that mix and match that I spoke to you about. So is there a way I can shut my account? There is, is there a way for me to close my account? There is introduction of uh, some kind of function words on the basis of the grammar of English. And in this manner, we're effectively able to enrich our ground truth and gain more variations of the same sentence with variation in syntax that is still retaining semantic meaning. And yeah, that's um, everything around semantics as a paraphrase detection and generation tool questions, and thank you. <laughs> yes. Right. 
So um, you're absolutely right. Uh, in that place, because you're looking for a word level substitution, generally data-driven approaches are better uh, because then you you don't have something general across various domains, right? So for instance, this can be used across various domains because it understands the construct of English as a grammar. But what you're talking about is say in, uh, in banking or say in um, the real estate sector, there would be certain words which are replaceable and so that's context sensitive and then you can have word level substitution. So I am not, uh, a linguist, so I don't really have actual algorithmic paradigms for you that, or approaches that would do that for you, but that's where you should start to look if that's what you want to solve. Okay. Any more questions?